Hi, I'm Catherine Reed Day, host of the St. Paul Forum. And joining me next is Hyde Erdrich, author of Original Local, a cookbook about Native American traditions. That's next on the St. Paul Forum. Welcome to the St. Paul Forum. I'm Catherine Reed Day, and joining me today is Hyde Erdrich, poet and cookbook author. Welcome, Hyde. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. You know, I have followed with a lot of interest so many different creative things that you've been doing. Could you uh, just introduce us briefly to how you, how long you've been writing, uh, where you started writing? I probably started writing when I was a child living in the Red River Valley. I was actually born in Minnesota on the Red River and grew up in North Dakota across the way in Wapaton and was always interested in art and writing and my parents encouraged me. My mom, Rita, was a very artful person. She's a painter, taught arts and crafts classes. And I went away to school when I was 14 to the East Coast, spent 10 years on the East Coast and moved back to St. Paul originally. Lived in St. Paul 14 years, taught at the University of St. Thomas, and then in 2007 I moved to Minneapolis and uh, have been there since then. It's wonderful. Great. Um, and so tell me just a little bit more about leaving at 14. What, where did you go to go to school? Because that was kind of young to be leaving. Yeah, home. I think it was, but I didn't know it at the time. Didn't know of it. course, you, were you so think you. Yeah, you think you're. <laughs> um, no, I had a scholarship, and I went to a boarding school, an Eastern Prep School in New Hampshire, and ended up going to college in New Hampshire too, and working there for a year afterwards. So, I was in New Hampshire for. Uh, almost nine years, and then I lived in uh, Massachusetts and Maryland. I always wanted to come home to the Midwest. You did. I never wanted to stay as long as I did. So I missed the prairies. I missed the landscape, the people, uh, being close to Ojibwe people, um, my mother's people, and I had wanted to learn the language a little bit. So um, that was one of the things that I set out to do when I came home. So when did you, you started le learning the Ojibwe language? I started then? to go to classes right in the first few years when I moved back to St. Paul, um, would go over to Minnesota, Minneapolis and sit at, in on uh, Jim Clark's classes. He was a wonderful elder, a great teacher of ours. And, uh, and just bit by bit, uh, worked my way up to spending a year, a year and a half of trying to learn at greater depth. And I found out as I knew in high school that I'm not a great student of languages and I would never really have fluency. But uh, I then d decided to help people who are trying to teach children and have fluency. And I started Wigwas Press, which uh, publishes Ojibwe language uh, monolingual books in Ojibwe. Great. And how long has that been operating now? Uh, 2010 is when we published our first book, uh, or maybe it was 2011, but we started our work in 2010. And we have uh, two more books, This one in uh, December, and one will be out by March. That's so, fantastic. Yeah. That's very exciting. Yeah, we have something wonderful. new and uh, such an important voice. It's yeah. been such a movement. I want to go back a little bit to this uh, creative life. So when you were growing up and you were nurtured around your creative voice, was it writing that you s saw yourself doing? Or uh, tell us a little bit about what uh, you yeah, were focused on. That's interesting. I, I don't think it was writing right away. I remember starting to write poems, you know, in the sixth or f fifth or sixth grade and thinking, you know, I'd like to do this. Uh, I thought I would write books someday and illustrate them. I liked visual arts and I spent a lot of time uh, in high school seriously training and thinking I would start working as a visual artist, but sometime between high school and college, I, I determined that that wasn't my path, and I became more interested in writing. Uh, but since then, I've worked with visual artists a lot. I have a lot of visual artists in my family, and after I left full-time teaching, I ended up curating exhibits here and there, um, 
you know, I'm not trained as a curator, but I ended up working with uh, exhibits and writing a lot about visual art and writing with and for visual artists and including that in my poetry and in, in everything I was doing. So I always had this interest in visual arts and um, I think that might be why I started making these little poem films too. Um, mm -hmm. It was part of uh, that visual art. But I consider cooking a visual art of sorts too, a sort of ephemeral visual it art. It is, and we're <laughs> going to talk about that in a moment. So one of the things I'm interested in too is that uh, this idea of finding one's voice, which mm -hmm. you know we were just talking about briefly before, um, you know, we, we both have children. Uh, we're in a, a time of transition in mm -hmm. so many respects. Uh, where do you think, uh, or how may, would you express the theme of your creative voice now? How do you, I'd like to kind of put, if there is any overarching theme to this before we dive into some of the specifics, how would you describe that? Well, I think at this point in my life, I am looking at both ways that I can break some of the traditions of being you know, primarily a poet, how I can branch out and work in other forms, um, and how I can bridge that with the visual art. And I think that one of the ways I did that was looking at, um, while being untraditional, starting to understand the traditional role for Ojibwe women um, that we sometimes describe a, as water keepers. Women are keeper of the waters. And that has all sorts of, you know, practical and metaphorical um, uh, notions in it, you know, from being pregnant, the waters of pregnancy, to actually literally caring for the purity of our water and knowing where the water is and how it's being treated. And so that, that became an interest of mine, but again, approaching it from an untraditional perspective, it's more about writing about water, um, more about um, looking at how we grow our food and food that needs protection through very pure water, like manuma and wild rice became a big part of the cookbook that I just wrote. Um, so I think that, in a lot of ways, has become my theme, um, my current theme. Uh, and it's sort of a through line for me. I've always talked about women's, women's bodies, women's roles. Um, and I think it's, it's just sort of moving toward a more universal uh, sort of landscape right now. Mm. So uh, there are a number of women who have been uh, doing some important work around water. Mm -hmm. um, how do you, can you talk just briefly about, I know that's a, a separate topic, but has that been informing your work in any way? Oh, sure, definitely. I mean, everything from the activism of individual women uh, who, you know, have done things like chain themselves to the doors of Enbridge offices trying to, um, you know, protest the pipelines coming through and the worries that that will pollute our waters. You know, Minnesota's a huge sponge. Anything that happens here happens to all the water. Um, and, or to people taking the waters of the Great Lakes and walking around to draw attention to cleaning the waters and protecting the waters of the Great Lakes. Uh, to uh, activists like Winona LaDuke who are trying to protect Manuman, um, which needs to grow in very, very pure water. Mm -hmm. And uh, other, you know, lesser known activists who are working very hard to um, seriously consider what's going to happen if we have the copper mining and the other types of mining that are going on in northern Minnesota and northern Wisconsin. The idea that we can protect the waters for 500 years if once they have been, or, or keep treating the, the water for 500 years after they've been um, contaminated, it seems un. It seems unreal. It seems it, unthinkable. It, it, it's and, hard to picture that we can even yeah. fathom that. And to me, it just seems like short-sighted on any model, yeah. even an economic model. What do we have? A lot of fresh water. What do people need to live? Not oil. We need a lot of fresh, a lot water. Of fresh water. So you'd think we would try and you know protect that resource at all costs, mm -hmm. you know. And so I mean, it's it's a complicated thing that. But I think it's it's something that most women will feel strongly about, and I hope that people engage. Mm -hmm. The idea that all women, um, you know, this is one of our roles. This is something that we need to this do. This is important. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about. You've obviously referenced the cookbook. Um, uh -huh. So let's talk about this this beautiful book that you've Thanks. produced, and uh, it's just full of so much wisdom and enjoyment and, and beauty. Um, where did the idea come from, um, and oh. how how is it? What's been the process? Well, that's a good question. I was when I was first talking with the publishers, I had this idea. I had the title in mind. Often I start with the title, original local. So um, in it, I wanted to uh, hit on the idea that the local foods movement, which has had so much passion poured into it and is so interesting and so accessible, had not really 
begun the conversation about how a lot of these foods were indigenous foods that were uh, stewarded, protected, and really fought for by indigenous people of the upper Midwest. And I really wanted to bring that story into the conversation. And I didn't do it through my own voice alone. Mm -hmm. um, I made, you know, a lot of recipes and I tweaked a lot of recipes as I worked on the cookbook. But there's also voices from, you know, food scientists and uh, you know, tribal folks, gardeners, uh, people working with youth. Uh, I tried to bring in as many voices as I, as I could and also touch on many of the m cultures in the upper Midwest. And I think people think, oh, we have D Dakota and Ojibwe, but there's so many other people too. Mm -hmm. So I tried to bring everybody into the All conversation. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the did you have a, a first recipe or two that was in your heart that you were thinking about as you as you started because yeah. you know a cookbook yeah. to me seems so overwhelming. <laughs> I mean, I think any book project sh should sober any of us, but yeah. but it just there's so many different directions you could go with it. So yeah. what were you? Well, I thought of the key ingredients first. I thought of manuman, wild rice, real hand harvested manuman, not the cultivated rice. Um, although I mentioned that briefly. Uh, fruits and berries that are really particular here that are wonderful and they're learning so much about them and I grew up eating those very important berrying is very important in my family uh, and of course people wanted to write about fish and game and I'm, I don't eat a lot of meat so that one was a huge challenge for me mm -hmm. um, but fun and and corn which most people don't think of the upper midwest as uh, and we think of it as corn country now but i don't think we think of indigenous corn but people had developed specific varieties and whole cultural concepts around the types of corn that were developed for their tribes and for their um, cultural groups and so for me that was really in something i hadn't learned before and i also hadn't really thought about how to use corn you know so that was a new it was a huge challenge for me it was really fun it was really fun what do you mean how to use corn i mean um oh you know you think of the very simple ways that that we use corn um you know most people think of corn on the cob you think of uh uh, you know, maybe tortillas, um, but it, there's just so many so other many things other. you can do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they came from, you know, original recipes. We used to eat something like tamales up here. And I don't think most people would think of that. They often think of Mexican, Mexican tamales cooking, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mexican cooking or cooking, um, you know, from further South, the uh, Pueblo tribes, but we actually did a lot of very similar dishes up here. And I was able to find some historic references. And then of course I don't, not a purist and don't cut things off at any point in time. So the way we traditional, you know, traditional foods and how we contemporarily use them is what right. I was mostly focusing on. If you're just joining us, I'm talking with Hyde Erdrich about her new cookbook, Original Local Indigenous Foods, Stories and Recipes from the Upper Midwest. Um, so um, so you, you looked at these different groups of, of foods, but um, there's so many layers to what you're talking mm -hmm. about because, uh, and, and I would like you to read something uh, from the book uh, to give them a flavor of it. Uh, okay. Maybe to start with, you can talk about this idea that, uh, that how does a poet do a cookbook? Um, so what were some of the things that let you blend uh, your, your, your primary voice, if we can call it that, and, and the forming of this cookbook? Well, when I started working on the cookbook, I, I had wonderful help of um, Shannon Penfeather at the uh, Historical Society Press, and she was able to help me make a sort of template so that I knew how to write uh, the, the, it was a form, really. To me, it was like a poetic form. There's a little head note at the top, and you put the ingredients in a certain order and so forth. And so... I was a poet, I liked that, and the little head note at the top I needed to really appeal to the senses and have you know, some humor in it or some passion or some drama. And so for me, those were tiny little prose poems and they were really fun to write. So I, I, I'd love to read one. Please so I'll do, read one. please okay. read one because it is fun. And it, it makes, I think one of the things that I loved about uh, engaging with the cookbook was, well, I, and I, I am a cook, um, I like to cook in general, but I think one of the barriers as we dabble into other you know, territory as cooks is to get familiar with ingredients. And so any way in which you're, you're encouraging us to, to look at the traditional, the ingredients, but you're also giving us permission to use what we have, sort of. So anyway, that yeah. was just something that I yeah. enjoyed was that it was permission giving yep. to explore. You wanted us to learn something, but... Um, 
it's not stern. Yeah, no, and I didn't <laughs> want it to be one of these things that food traditions and traditional foods, as we call them in Native communities, some of them are ceremonial, some of them nobody wants to change the recipe because it connects us to our, you know, our ancestry and so forth. And I made very clear that this, that's not the um, direction I'm going, and occasionally somebody will reminisce about that, or I might you know, include a little historic quote about a traditional dish. But for the most part, it was the ingredient. The ingredient was indigenous. It would have been found here in the upper Midwest before 1600, and it's something that people still have access to. Mm -hmm. There's some foods that people don't have access to, and I didn't want to focus on them because I wanted it to be something everyone could do. Um, you know, change ingredients if you want to, the fancier you want to get um, if you're able to, go ahead and do that. But a lot of people don't have access to right. these foods, so I tried to mix it up a little bit. Um, when I was writing about some some foods, there was just so much of nostalgia. So this one is wild plum clafouti. And clafouti is a French word for a sort of very simple, eggy kind of uh, uh, pie with no crust. My love loves me, and I know, because he makes me clafouti. The most tender and simple way to treat fresh fruit is all Frenched up in name, but down home in fact. There is nothing more lovely to put to your lips except perhaps a kiss. <laughs> <laughs> so with those That's little so head perfect notes. perfect for a near Valentine's Day show here. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, lovely. you know, that is that is definitely one of the things I like to have when I'm being treated kindly by my wonderful husband, John. And John Burke helped me with the cookbook, too, a lot. He's the baker in the house. And even if I had wanted to do all the baking myself, he would have jumped in mm -hmm. and worked on it. Uh, it takes more than two people to write a cookbook because writing and actually manipulating the food at the same time is very difficult. Yes. So you definitely need some assistance. Um, and I was lucky I had a lot of it. And people have to try and eat things. You know, you can't eat it all yourself. It takes, it takes a village, <laughs> as they say. That's great. So, um, you know, again, one of the basic ideas here, we've talked briefly about water, but the, the notion of food, food traditions, family, and mm -hmm. connection is so uh, deep here. I also am in, interested in this uh, relationship to movements um, and ac activism that is, is shared here. Mm -hmm. Where and I feel it's very again permission giving. It's mm -hmm. basically um, it seems to me that part of what you're doing is is asking us to bridge um, divides. Uh, I think so. Fears, yeah. um, which seems so absolutely vital mm -hmm. uh, for so many reasons. So I love it that it seems as though food is something that does bring us together. Uh, could you maybe read about the um, uh, this this one section we talked about? Okay. That, would you and maybe maybe introduce it for us? When I was working on the cookbook, I would sometimes encounter an ingredient that I was able to get because I had native friends and family members. Uh, but there would be it would be difficult to offer that as something I thought would generally be available. Um, one of those things was a wild turnip. Um, uh, tipsna or tipsna that uh, Dakota and Lakota people find very important. But of course, everybody up here ate these wild turnips. Uh, so I wrote a little bit about that. Every cookbook of Native American foods from North or South Dakota contains a recipe for wild turnips or prairie turnips. The Dakota word for this important food source is tipsna, and in Lakota it's tipsula. Although I was gifted with the use of a beautiful braid, I have chosen not to include a recipe here because the food source is now just too rare. It's beautiful uh, dried and braided, uh, small sort of teardrop shaped uh, roots. Uh, in South Dakota, the Native American food company that makes wooden knife fry bread mix has omitted wild turnip from its list of ingredients in South Dakota, the Native American food company that makes wooden knife fry bread mix has omitted wild turnip from its lists of ingredients, saying, Tipsla is no longer an ingredient in our fry bread mix due to the habitat loss and changing environment. It is our decision not to add stress on the plants. Mm -hmm. So I love the way they put that. Mm -hmm. So Slow Food USA has created an arc of taste to feature critically endangered foods in order to draw attention to threats to food diversity and to encourage, when possible, the sales of seeds for home gardeners. Foods listed there include hand-harvested wild rice, manumen, and beans and squashes developed long ago by indigenous farmers around the Great Lakes and in North Dakota. 
Other foods, such as cream peas and several types of pawpaw, are listed as endangered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, along with dozens of aquatic animals and plants too threatened to dishonor here with a recipe. And some foods, such as tipsna and ceremonial corn, are so culturally important in their habitat so deeply within tribal lands or treaty areas, the tribes must steward them as they see fit. In an era when genes can be patented and enormous profits made from altering traditional foods, such as corn, it falls to cultures to remain in control of their food resources. In fact, we all need the means to our own food production, or we owe our souls to the company's so store. This notion is the essence of the food sovereignty and food security movements. Food sovereignty is a central concern of the White Earth Land Recovery Project in Minnesota, which encourages the adoption of tribal food policies. And then I um, include a draft a bit of their food policy off their website, which is very interesting. And um, it talks about the creator and the relatives uh, with wings, fins, roots, or paws. Uh, how these people are related to us and we have a reciprocal relationship to them and it goes on to be more legal in nature talking about treaty boundaries um, of 1855 and 1837 treaties. I think generally people are understanding about um, or have, a, have an awareness of how fishing rights are part of treaties but there's also gathering rights and there's a connection to these other foodstuffs mm -hmm. that are very important. In the end uh, that treat that uh, a bit of uh, of a document says, more recently our people have faced diminished access to traditional foods and medicines as a result of colonization, economic, ecological, and juris jurisdictional practices. Mm -hmm. And it cites the rise of obe obesity and diabetes among children as evidence of the urgent need to return to indigenous food ways and to establish policies that declare our health and indeed the future of our nation is tied to secure access and relationships with our traditional Anishinaabe foods. So there's a lot of wisdom, a lot of energy going into uh, trying to protect and, and, and make connections uh, and make a pathway to the future mm -hmm. for, with these foods. Mm -hmm. So uh, it just se I really appreciate your taking the time to read that for us. It, it does seem to me that, that what you're contributing to is a movement that you're hopeful about. Um, uh, you know, and why is that important to you uh, to have these hopeful movements. Well, I have children, first of all, and I've seen how hard people work. But also, my grandfather was a, gar a truck gardener on our home reservation, and my um, other grandfather on my father's side was a butcher here in small town Minnesota. And I feel like it's, it's a tradition in my family, a personal family tradition as well as a cultural family tradition to um, produce food and to be involved in, in, in that movement. My, most of my siblings work in the Indian Health Service, so health through uh, traditional foods is an area that they're all interested in and that they all promote. So um, it's just it's something that I think is meaningful and not, not particular to just Native people. I think we all need to start thinking mm -hmm. around the idea of how do we produce our own foods. Absolutely, I'm the I'm that backyard gardener. Who, uh, <laughs> I love it. I love it, and yeah. yet I'm also so so awkward at it. But uh, there is something just so uh, satisfying about knowing that I have a piece of land that is there to, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's a gift to it's have. It's amazing, isn't it? How it much is. you can produce it's in such astounding. a little spot. Mm -hmm. And um, I love the idea of sharing it and exchanging it with people, and so. Um, I love I love having a tool like this mm -hmm. uh, that bridges so many important ideas, and I um, uh, want to encourage more people to uh, explore what you've done here. How can they uh, find? Are you going to have a reading soon again? I have a reading on February nineteenth at the uh, Hamlin Branch Library in the Fireside series, and I'll read from the cookbook, talk about it, maybe do some of the more um, fun and curious recipes. Uh, talk about them a little bit. I'm not positive we might have samples occasionally. Some samples. Yes. Oh, well, that'll entice occasionally, people. Occasionally, we'll see if I can swing that because I do like to do that when I give a reading. What do you? Uh, I'm now. I'm really curious. Which are the the fun and what was the other word used? Fun and more enticing recipes. Yeah. Um, what 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 would be on that list for you? Um, 
well, you know, some of them are really simple things, uh, like sort of revisions of recipes that include bacon to use tonka bites, which are bison bites that are easily available. You can order them online. You can buy them at several stores in town. Uh, but, you know, swap up the bacon for some dried uh, bison and uh, just a different... Just some, a little different. Yeah, something simple it. and different. You know, I think mentioning that too, I have ordered uh, food from both White Earth and from uh, Red Lake. Mm -hmm. um, and are there also... So that's something that people can do online is find... Uh, are there other... Uh, references that you made. Yeah, in the there's book. a there's, there's a, a lot of resources mm -hmm. in the book. One of the things that I wanted to do when I talked to the publisher is like I'd like to include the resources and make sure people can get to them. They go out of date really quickly, which is is um, sort of sad to say, but also just makes people go out there and look harder. I think, and there are even things that I wasn't able to include, like White Earth has realwildrice.com. It has a new online uh, or service to order wild rice from White Earth in um, in Western Minnesota, and uh, and I love their uh, packaging and it's just a really nice it is really but it was yeah. it came up too late for me to get it sure. into the book so but it's, it'll obviously be something I'll be continuing to stimulate yeah and um, I like it the, the Minnesota press I, can you make just a couple of uh, I think people probably realize that the, the that the press is is there but have they been a good partner for you oh the historical society press has been a great partner I've, I've worked with them before I had a um, uh, anthology of native women's writing that I did with them and I've admired many of their authors and have uh, looked at some of their projects as they were being created. They're great with cookbooks. They have yeah. produced a number of they wonderful have, cookbooks. True. I love the Bunt Pan cookbook or the Bunt, <laughs> Bunt cookbook. I just love that. Um, my take on the Bunt is uh, actually my sister Lise uh, gave me a recipe for something called man cake, which oh. has wild rice and bison and other ground meats oh, in it, turkey, and uh, made in a bunt, put a uh, sort of a crust on it, and then iced with sriracha and mustard and ketchup. Oh my gosh. So it says happy this, birthday on it. It's like, well, this, this should, is what a man wants, she says, Valentine, for a cake. Uh, message oh, that would be, close, that would so. be a sweet one <laughs> for Valentine's Day. That's all we have time for today. Thank you for joining us on the St. Paul Forum. Come back again next week.